This is going to be an introduction to the Go language aimed at programmers having at least a basic familiarity with JavaScript. It may also help to have basic familiarity with C, but that is not expected. I'm not going to cover every detail of Go, but I'll hit all the major concepts fairly thoroughly. Go is quite young, first released publicly in late 2009. The primary three authors of the language are Rob Pike, Ken Thompson, and Robert Griesemer, all developers at Google. Both Rob Pike and Ken Thompson were previously well known for their involvement in the development of Unix, and Thompson was one of the primary authors of the C language. In many ways, Go is targeted as a successor to C and C++, but Go is a higher level language. Most notably, Go is garbage collected and memory safe. Consequently, unlike C and C++, Go is generally inappropriate for low-level code and very high-performance code, such as in operating systems and graphically intensive games. Where Go excels is in concurrency, thanks to two features, Go routines and channels. Go routines allow us to create many separate threads of execution without the usual overhead, and channels give us a simple mechanism to communicate between our threads and synchronize them. Along with native compilation, these features make Go particularly well suited for server code, and that is where Go has most commonly been used. Beyond servers, Go is surprisingly well suited for small scripts that otherwise would be written in Python, Ruby, the shell, or other dynamic languages. Even though Go is statically typed, it largely avoids the burdens usually associated with statically typed languages. Unlike most recent languages, Go is not object-oriented, at least not in the classical sense. Instead of requiring us to define a hierarchy of types in our programs, Go allows us to express ad hoc relationships between types with what are called interfaces. As we'll see, an interface defines a set of methods, and any type that implements all of the methods of an interface is considered to automatically implement that interface as well. The practical result is that Go programmers don't have to worry about building and managing complex type hierarchies. What I most appreciate about Go is that the language stringently avoids complexity in both the rules of the language and in its toolchain. The creators of Go have resisted the usual temptation to pile on more and more features, allowing the users of Go to think about the problems they want to solve instead of wasting time thinking about the language. Just like in JavaScript, variables in Go are declared by var statements. What's different in Go is that we specify a type after the variable name. Here we specify that this variable foo is of type string, and so the Go compiler only allows us to assign strings to foo, not any other kind of value. This is static typing. The programmer must declare a type for every variable, and the compiler then enforces that type. Specifying the types of every variable tends to make our code verbose, but Go allows a variable's type to be left inferred if we initialize the declaration. Here, the compiler infers that foo is a string variable because we initialize it with a string in the declaration. In any subsequent assignments, the compiler requires that we assign only strings to foo, just like if we had explicitly declared the type. As a further convenience, we can leave out the word var if we put a colon before the equals sign. Unlike in JavaScript, variables in Go may not be declared more than once in a scope. Here, the compiler will complain that we are redeclaring foo. To fix this, we should use the colon only in the first assignment. In truth, the compiler needn't be so picky, but the authors of Go didn't want programmers to habitually use colon equals when they only need assignment, because that habit might lead to unintended declarations. Another difference from JavaScript is that control flow constructs like if, else, and loops are each their own scope. Here we declare a variable y inside this if, and so y only exists inside the if. If we move the declaration of y above the if, it now exists both within the if and without. When we declare a variable y both outside the if and also within, then these are two separate variables that just happen to share the same name. Outside the if, y refers to the outer variable. Inside the if, y refers to the inner variable. So here, the call to foo is passed the value of the outer y, which was last assigned 5. Aside from strings, Go also has a Boolean type called bool. Bool, of course, has two values, true and false. Where things get complicated is with numbers. In JavaScript, we have just one number type, which is represented as 64-bit floating point, but in Go, we have several different number types with different sizes. For integers, we have four sizes, 8 bits, 16 bits, 32 bits, or 64 bits. For floating point numbers, we have two sizes, 32 bits and 64 bits. If you don't understand the distinction between integers and floating point, or if you don't understand the significance of the number of bits, you should watch my earlier video called Numbers as Bits. The short explanation is that integers represent only whole numbers, while floating point values have a fractional component, like 3.47. The more bits to represent the number, the larger the range of possible values. 
For example, an 8-bit integer can only represent the numbers negative 128 up to positive 127, but a 16-bit integer can represent the values from negative 32,768 up to positive 32,767. Go also has unsigned integer types, which represent only positive values, including 0. For example, an 8-bit unsigned integer can represent integers from 0 up to positive 255. Complex numbers, you may remember from math class, are the sum of two components, one of which is imaginary. In Go, these two parts are represented as two floating-point numbers. So a complex 64 is made up of two 32-bit floating-point numbers, and a complex 128 is made up of two 64-bit floating-point numbers. You won't need complex numbers unless you do certain kinds of mathematics, but I mention them here for completeness. Finally, we have these five types, which are actually equivalent to other existing types. A plain int is equivalent to either an int32 or an int64. On 32-bit platforms, 32-bit integers tend to be more efficient to use, but on 64-bit platforms, 64-bit integers tend to be more efficient, so the size of an int depends upon the platform for which we're compiling. Unless you have good reason to use some other type, int should be your default choice to represent a number. uint ptr, as in unsigned integer pointer, is an unsigned integer type that is large enough to store a memory address. Memory addresses vary in size between platforms, so the size of uint ptr depends upon which platform we're compiling for. The byte type is merely an alias for uint8, and the rune type is merely an alias for int32. A byte, of course, is 8 bits, and rune is a unicode term for a single character. These aliases exist simply to make the intent of some code more clear. Now, you may be wondering what happens when the results of number operations produce values too big or too small for the number type range. Well, in general, the result will wrap around. For example, the max value of a uint8 is 255, and so if we add 1 to 255, the value overflows to 0. And if we add 3 to 255, the value overflows to 2. Conversely, if we subtract 1 from the smallest uint8 value, which is 0, we get underflow to 255. If we subtract 10 from 4, we get underflow to 250. The same thing happens for all integer types, just with different min and max values. For an int 16, for example, we get overflow when we exceed 32,767, and we get underflow when we go below negative 32,768. For floating point numbers, it's a different story. Rather than overflow, a floating point operation that should return a result larger than the greatest possible value instead returns a special value plus infinity. Likewise, a floating point operation that should return a result lesser than the smallest possible value instead returns a special value negative infinity. Actually, the floating point story is more complicated than this because of rounding and precision issues, but we won't discuss those details here. Suffice it to say that you should be careful when dealing with values at the extremities of the number type ranges. And in case you ever need to do math with arbitrary precision, the Go standard library provides a package called math slash big for that purpose. Also understand that Go is serious about these number types all being separate types. You might think we should be able to assign this int32 variable bar to the int64 variable foo because all int32 values fit in the range of an int64, but Go will reject this assignment. To satisfy the compiler, we have to explicitly convert the int32 value to an int64, and only then is the assignment allowed. Similarly, we cannot perform arithmetic on two values of different types. Instead, we must explicitly convert the two values to a matching type. Here we must get the int64 equivalent of bar if we want to add bar to foo. When converting from an int32 to an int64, the value is preserved, but in some conversions, the value may end up distorted. When converting from an int to a uint8, for example, many int values do not fit in range of a uint8, and so the converted value won't necessarily be the same. Here, converting the int value 500 to uint8 produces the value 244 by truncating the int down to its least significant 8 bits. When declaring number variables, understand that number literals themselves do not have any particular type, and so can be used in assignments to any kind of number. However, when a variable's type is inferred from a number literal, integer literals default to int, and floating point literals default to float64. Lastly, be clear that int is always a different type than int32 or int64, even when an int has the same underlying representation. As far as the compiler is concerned, they are different sorts of things. Go function definitions should look quite familiar. 
The only difference from JavaScript here is that we write func instead of function. Unlike in JavaScript, however, this function foo can only be called with zero arguments, and because foo doesn't specify any return type, it cannot return anything. In contrast, this version of function foo takes two parameters, a string and a boolean, and returns an int. Whereas a function in dynamic languages like JavaScript can return different kinds of values, a function in a static language like Go has to declare what kind of value it returns. Having declared this function foo to return an int, the compiler will object if we attempt to return a string or some other kind of value. Likewise, the compiler will complain if we attempt to call this function with the wrong types of arguments or the wrong number of arguments. Even when we pass to a function values from variables or values returned by function calls, the compiler will know if the types match the function parameters because all variables have a declared type and all functions have a declared return type. A unique feature of Go is that functions can be declared to return more than one value. Here the function foo returns both an int and a string. When we call this function, the returned int is assigned to a and the returned string is assigned to b. Multi-return functions cannot be called where a single value is expected. So the call here is invalid because the context expects just a single number. Often when calling a multi-return function, we don't care about all the returned values. As a convenience, underscore is a special variable name which doesn't actually get assigned any value. When you assign to underscore, the value is effectively discarded. So you can only use underscore to discard values from multiple returns. We otherwise can't use it as a variable. I mentioned earlier that Go is picky about redeclaring variables. Well, Go is less picky in this special case. Here we are effectively redeclaring the variable A in the multi value assignment, but the compiler won't complain. To make Go code look prettier and less cluttered, Go allows us to leave most semicolons implicit. What happens is that the compiler will insert semicolons at the end of any line ending with a literal, an identifier, the reserved words break, continue, fall through, and return, the increment and decrement operators and the end delimiters, which are end parentheses, end curly brace, and end square brackets. Note that the Go spec considers types like int and float64 to be identifiers, so the compiler will insert semicolons after those words when they're at the end of the line. In this example, the compiler will insert four semicolons, one after the number literal three, one after the end curly brace, and two after these end parentheses. Perhaps surprisingly, the grammar of Go actually does expect a semicolon after a function declaration, we just usually never see it because we leave it implicit. In this case, the compiler will insert three semicolons, two after the end parentheses, and one after the end curly brace. The semicolon insertion rules effectively prevent us from formatting our code in certain ways. For example, putting our opening curly braces on their own line will cause semicolons to be inserted in places where the compiler doesn't want them. Another oddity of Go syntax is that it allows you to put a comma after the last argument to a function. This is useful when we spread a function call onto multiple lines, because then a comma after the last argument will prevent insertion of an unwanted semicolon. Here we declare variable a to be an array of four ints. Unlike in JavaScript, arrays in Go have a fixed size that must be specified upon creation, and a single array can only hold values of one type. So here when we assign a string to index 3 of this array of ints, the compiler will complain that we are assigning the wrong type. Likewise, we'll get an error if we attempt to assign to an out-of-bounds index. In this case, because the out-of-bounds index is specified by constant, the compiler will catch the error. If we specify the out-of-bounds index with a variable, however, the error will not be caught until the assignment is attempted at runtime. Also understand that the size of each array must be known at compile time, and so we can specify array sizes only with constants, not with variables or other expressions that can be evaluated only at runtime. Here we create another variable which is an array of four ints. Assigning array A to array B copies all of the values of A to B. Understand that the variables here are themselves arrays. They store the values directly. This is different from JavaScript, where every variable is merely a reference to some object elsewhere in memory. In JavaScript, assigning A to B would make A and B both reference the same array object, but here in Go, A and B are always two separate arrays with separate values. To assign one array to the other, they of course must be the same type. For example, an array of view ints is not the same as an array of ints, so this assignment is illegal. The size of an array is an integral part of its type, so an array of 3 ints is not the same type as an array of 4 ints. 
Here the function foo takes as argument an array of four ints and in the function assigns to the first index of the array. Be clear, however, that the array A is copied to B and so modifications of B don't affect A. They are two separate arrays. Given any type in the language, we can make an array of it, even other arrays. So here we have an array of two arrays of three ints, a so-called multidimensional array. Again, unlike JavaScript, the arrays are fixed in size, and so we cannot assign the indexes out of bounds. Also unlike JavaScript, the elements of an array in Go are always stored contiguously in memory. If we have an array of arrays, that means we have multiple arrays stored next to each other in memory. Here, for example, is what an array of two arrays of three ints looks like in memory. And here's what an array of two arrays of three arrays of two ints looks like in memory. However, the elements of an array are not always directly contiguous. In some cases, the compiler will put unused bytes of padding in between elements of an array so that the elements better align to four and eight byte boundaries, effectively trading away memory efficiency for better processing efficiency.